Hi, I'm Steve Rendell for FAIR TV. Plenty to talk about this week. We start in Chicago where the teachers union is squaring off against Mayor Rahm Emanuel and it couldn't be clear which side the corporate media are on. Some pundits claim the teachers oppose any change in Chicago's schools. As New York Times columnist Joe Nocera wrote on September 11th, quote, the status quo, which is what the Chicago teachers want, is clearly unacceptable. In Chicago, about 60% of public school students graduate from high school, close quote. A Washington Post editorial also accused the teachers of fighting to preserve the status quo and its low graduation rates. So Chicago teachers want nothing to change? That might be news to them, as their website shows. They want smaller class sizes, more support staff, and the closing of funding gaps between schools. To claim they want low graduation rates is absurd and offensive, but you can say almost anything about teachers unions in the corporate media. The Post also ran a Charles Lane op-ed angrily denouncing the union's demands because Chicago teachers earn far more than the largely impoverished families whose children they teach. Quote, I cannot describe the moral repugnance of this strike by aggrieved middle-class professionals against the aspiring poor, close quote. Yes, teachers are even against the poor. Lane neglects to mention if he thinks journalists in big cities with high poverty rates should also take a pay cut, but then journalists aren't teachers. A shocking new CIA torture story in the September 6 New York Times shows the paper of record is still incapable of calling things what they are when the things in question are torture and when the torture in question is the U.S. government. This case involves a CIA prisoner in Libya during the Bush years who gave his account to Human Rights Watch. He described being subjected to waterboarding torture, being stripped naked and chained to a wall, and forced into various stress positions. But instead of using the T-word, the Times preferred euphemisms like mistreatment, interrogation methods, and CIA techniques. The paper didn't totally avoid the word torture. There's a reference to a board being used in water torture deep in the piece, but contrast the Times' timid language with Human Rights Watch's announcement of the report, which began, quote, the United States government during the Bush administration tortured opponents of Muammar Gaddafi. It's important to point out that this isn't new. A 2010 study by Harvard students showed major U.S. media outlets called waterboarding torture until the practice was taken up by the U.S. If this story were about Libyans being tortured under Gaddafi, we're guessing the New York Times would have called torture by its name. And finally, the Washington Post presented a two-page energy debate on September 11th, but industry critics were missing, perhaps because the discussion was sponsored by the oil industry, a fact the Post failed to tell its readers. The feature was mostly short comments from discussions at the Republican and Democratic conventions that were sponsored by the Post and the Bipartisan Policy Center. But the Post failed to credit one sponsor, VoteForEnergy.org, which is really the American Petroleum Institute, the main lobbying group of the oil and gas industry. So if you're wondering why the Post feature failed to include bona fide critics of the energy giants, voices that might speak out against fracking, strongly advocate for renewable energy, or warn about climate change, that would seem to be your answer. Instead, readers heard mostly from politicians and think tank experts who touted the benefits of oil and gas drilling. Readers were even treated to the climate change denying Republican candidate for governor of West Virginia. At the forum held at the Republican convention, Emily Akhtarzandi, the Post Strategic Partnership Executive, credited the American Petroleum Institute in her opening remarks, saying the group, quote, saw the value in making today's conversation possible, close quote. Arranging a debate that excludes your critics is, of course, very valuable. And so is seeing that one-sided discussion spread across two pages of the biggest newspaper in the nation's capital. It was a good day for big oil. This is Steve Rendell for FAIR TV.